Global Design Director at IBM, and he will be speaking to us today on design. So please welcome Michael Tam to the stage. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? All right, awake? I'm not a morning person, so, <laughs> so I can feel um, um, some of your struggle if you, if you have that. So um, I'm very, very excited today to be here with you to speak about design, something very, very close to my heart and something pretty much make up of my whole life, <laughs> in a sense. So um, let's talk about design. When, you know, I think designers, we see patterns um, that some other people might not be able to see. So when I first went up onto the Creative Morning website and I look at the, um, the event title of today, it says, Michael Tam on design. And I see something probably only I can see. Because as I read it again, I see Michael Tam design. That's literally my last name. And um, my family name is pretty unique because it's, it's kind of rare. And it literally means Michael Talk Design. So I think that's just perfect for today. Um, and I think my parents are going to be very happy because finally I get a chance to, um, to show the world how unique my family name is. But as we're going to start with talking about design, let's start with the, um, the stereotypes and myths about design and designers. Okay? 13 years ago, I was a junior advertising creative. That's not me. <laughs> That's not me. He, he looks pretty cool. But um, I was a junior uh, advertising creative starting in New Zealand in an agency. And the first ever question, my senior, senior art director, that was him. I looked him up on Facebook years ago, his picture. He, he asked me a question. He was sitting next to me holding a napkin with a scribble on it. And he turned around. He said, Michael, you can make things look nice, right? Stereotype, right? Because everyone expects designers can make things look pretty. Well, I'm sure you can all do that. I can do that, but I can do more. I can design with intent. I can be strateg strategized. I can, um, I can create impact and much, much more. Okay, that's the first stereotype of designers. And then fast forward to 2020. I was having my final interview with IBM, IBM IX, more specifically, is the um, experience design consulting arm of IBM. And um, I remember uh, I was given an um, um, office tour, an office tour around the, uh, uh, in the office, meeting people, and I met up with the uh, general manager at the time. And I remember very vividly that I was introduced my, by my hire to the general manager that he said, this is our incoming creative lead. He wears ripped jeans. Cool, right? Okay. Well, the, I think what he was really trying to say is, I'm going to be hired to make IBM look cool again. <laughs> well, a designer is supposed to be fashionable. I don't know. But, um, but today, I'm IBM's global design director. And I work on, I love working on complex enterprise business problem, helping my clients to solve the problem strategically. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't think any designers would like to be judged like a book, like, like a book cover, right? But I think for today, because there's a lot of designers here, and uh, I'm happy to comply to this myth. So I wear my tight ripped jeans just for the occasion. And, um, but hopefully, you all understand that we, as designers, we can do way more than making things look nice and being fashionable, in a sense. But whether this looks as fashionable or not, well, you can be the judge. I don't really care. I don't really care. Designers are sort of eccentric artists, aren't, aren't we? Well, some people certainly think that. But I think it's important that we have some sort of creative pride being a little bit different. At IBM, we celebrate Wild Ducks designers. Especially today, in our days, we, with all this complex enterprise business problem that we all face, 
it's important that we bring a diverse group of thinkers with different backgrounds, different skill set to the table. Everything that I'm trying to say here is that I think we, we need design to be more. But how? In what way? How can we make design more? What can, how can we evolve design to be the 2.0 that it can deliver more impact? Well, I have three very simple personal story to share with you, and hopefully it can help us to, well, hopefully it can illustrate how might we make design better. The first story is about embracing ambiguity. 26 years ago, um, my family graduated, I'm sorry, not graduated, immigrated to New Zealand. And um, I, was, um, I was a teenager, um, Thankfully, I, speak, um, I spoke um, pretty decent English, but as a student, I failed all my maths, my science subjects, everything. So I, had, I really had no clue what my future holds, especially start, gonna be starting a new life in a new country. And that sort of uh, cluelessness took me all towards u university. And that was the time when we had the, um, well, some of you probably remember the early 2000 dot-com crash. So it means I didn't know what I wanted to study. I was hopping from one major to another. I was studying computer science and then hop over to accounting, information system, e-commerce. Well, the list getting really, really long. And finally, I graduated in marketing. But guess what? I didn't do that. I, didn't, I, I did none of those majors. I turns out to be an advertising creative. And, well, because I figured that I can draw. When I was re really young, I loved drawing. So I thought that would be fun to do, to be an advertising creative. And, and in, this, in, this, in, that, in that industry, it was, apart from the fun, it was very fast moving. And fast moving to a point that I, I didn't know what's next. And turns out, it was a job in Hong Kong. An agency job in Hong Kong took me back to where I was born. And, uh, but then, I basically just hopped on applying, and I didn't know what's waiting for me in terms of I wasn't ready culturally, I wasn't ready professionally, and all that. So I think that's, um, that's the nature of my life all that time. Um, even though now I'm looking back as a designer, as a creative, um, seems like my career turns out all right, and my work seems to be okay. Uh, but then it seems like throughout my whole career, I have always been staring at a blank canvas. And I, but, but then little did I know, that actually got me ready. It got, it's, a, it's a blessing in disguise. Because now, after all these years of not knowing what I wanted to do, it got me ready to embrace ambiguity every time when I'm giving a new brief, when I'm giving a new business challenge. So today, I help IBM to transform big enterprise client business. Um, like this pack of, uh, actually, I got some chips in here. <laughs> I like this pack of chips. You can easily get it from a 7-Eleven down the road. Very simple, someone deliver it to the shelves and you just go pick it up. But little that you know, the complexity behind having a bunch of a big workforce to make sure these chips are fresh, crisp, and ready for you to pick up. So it will be much easier than Someone just come to, a, come to a talk and then someone giving it out. So this part of the experience. Catch someone, oops, <laughs> nice. And it's hopefully stay crisp. Oh, sorry, That's, there you go. All right. <laughs> so back to the story of with Lates. Um, when I first hopped on this project, it's actually my first project when I joined the, uh, the global design team in, at IBM. And I was dropped into a 300 people, 300 people um, uh, agile innovation 
um, group, which is which was um, which was uh, resourced by um, which, which was made up of resources of uh, both IBMers and um, and um, employees at Lates, and um, they were they were going through this journey. It was um, two years. Uh, in, they were, we were two years in the journey of a, of a 10 years transformation project. And I can tell you, we were, faced, we were facing so much challenge and so much unknown when we were working, helping the client to reinvent the future experience of how frontline employees of late, how do they go from the factory, pick up chips, make sure everything is right, get it to the shelf and constantly every day go back into a 7-Eleven, a Walmart and reshuffle those chips to make sure the fresh ones are up front so that you can pick up the right ones. So every step of the way on this journey, we, were, we, we have no answer. We have absolutely no answer what we should design as, as transformation consultants. But then I think I can be very thankful for all, the, all those years before when I was facing all unknown. It trained me up to know that it's okay not to have the answer. But all you need to do as a designer is to ask questions, make assumptions, validate your assumptions, do your research, bring other people along, bring your client along, and hopefully, as you move forward, you prototype forward, and then you can come up with the right answer along the way. So if you are facing, if you are a designer right now, or even if you're not a designer, if you're facing a blank canvas, facing a almost insurmountable challenge for your business, for the project that you do, embrace that. And it's gonna make you stronger. And if you felt like you, have, you don't have the right answer, it's okay too because you can learn from that if you prototype forward, if you test your assumptions, if you test your ideas forward. So my advice for you when you're facing a blank canvas is that you should always ask, what if? What if your client want this? What if your customer want this? What if you can have no restriction or no constraint to your solutions? Because only by asking what if, that's your superpower as a designer, bring onto, onto a team that is hoping to help to transform business uh, from today's struggle to, to be ready for tomorrow. So design is really about asking what if. My second story is about reduction. Even at the very early days of my career, I have never hold back from sharing and giving away everything that I know, all my knowledge. I was never held back from um, sharing with my peers or anyone who's willing to be an audience. So in the past nine months, I have been teaching experience design at H Academy. Um, and well, H Academy is an education platform with uh, happier recruitment. And in the not last nine months, 51 students, four cohorts, they all sign up just to learn UX design. But I decided I want to teach them everything that I know, from design thinking, to consulting, to um, storytelling, everything that I, I would give away to them. But why did I do that? What's the reason? As a designer, why should I give it all away? It's my competitive advantage in a sense, right? Well, this is, um, this is why. Do you remember back in the days when you were a student? There is always, back in school days, there's always another student next to you trying to cover up the answer. Cover up the answer so that you can't see whether it is the homework or whether it's, the, um, it's in an exam paper. They always try to cover up. The problem with that is you stop yourself from learning more because you're living on your reserve. You're living on your reserve. She's, like in this situation, in this book, Paul Arden said, the hoarder, she's already reducing her capabilities because she's living on her reserve. 
So, which is why, that is the reason why I never stop myself from giving what I knew away. Because only that you can grow as a designer. If you give everything away, you're left with nothing, you are forced to look around, you are forced to replenish and relearn. So since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been dedicating my time to um, design mentorship, um, seven, over 7,000 7, uh, 7, minutes of them through a platform called ADP List. Um, they are a platform that looks to uh, democratize mentorship for everyone in the world. And I was very lucky to have the chance in, those nine, um, in the past year to speak with over 120 um, students, or not students, or young designers all around the world. Um, and I realized this whole experience validates my belief all along, is that when I give away more, the more I gain. I become a better design mentor because I need to always find a different ways to communicate, to articulate, with, to, to connect with these designers from different levels, different backgrounds. But at the same time, also I become a better design leader because I hear the stories from these mentees. They came from different industry, they come from different agency, in-house, whatnot, and I learn as well. So when I give away, when I have less, I gain more. So great design is about achieving more through reduction. Okay? And, but I think, I believe this growth mindset is not just going to be limited to designers, but it should be applicable for everyone. So next time when someone, well, next time that means could be in about 15, 10 minutes, when someone reach out to you, seek your help, seek your advice, when they get to that collaboration table over there, writing down what's, what, what kind of help they need, ask yourself, are you giving it all away? Because that's your chance to grow, whether you are a designer or not, that's your chance to be better. My final and third story is about, on contrary, from the last one, is about addiction. Now I'm looking back to my, um, my career, my 12 years of career. It's not really that long, but um, it's, you know, especially compared, compared to some of you, it's not really that long, but it's all right. Um, I moved on from, you know, from, from different countries, from New Zealand to Hong Kong. I, will, I moved on from, from agencies to in-house to, to now with a um, global consultancy. And I realized, um, even, even in this such short amount of time, I made a lot of big pivots um, in my career from one industry to another, and the job nature is very different. And I have, you know, is, is, I think I did all right, I guess, but um, a lot of my mentees ask me, how did you do it? How did you, did you plan for it? What was your secret? Well, if there's only one thing that I would tell my younger self is to turn up and be indispensable. That would be my advice for my younger self. But thankfully, I don't need to um, hop on a DeLorean and go 88 miles per hour back in time to tell myself, my younger self, on that. Because my mom did that for me. She showed me the way. Many years ago, when, um, when my family, um, like I mentioned before, immigrated to New Zealand, uh, my mom realized the importance of speaking better English. So she signed me up, signed me and my brother back then, to, a, um, to have private tutors with an a older lady uh, her name is her name was um, Mrs. Martin. I still remember that. I actually, it's it's a actually great ex, um, experience for me preparing this talk because I actually sort of gone down memory lane and went on Google Map and that was her house. I think <laughs> if I remember, still remember. Um, and she was um she was a um, widow lady on uh, living on her own um, in her sixties. Very, very kind lady, and um, all I, I did um, with her and my brother uh, with her was when um, we were we biked to her bike along the, the, the seaside and uh, went to her place and have conversations 
simple English lessons, have conversations, read a little bit. So there was nothing really stood out or memorable apart from remembering her. She had, actually funny enough, she had her cat. I found this icon. I, I was very happy when I found this icon because it, it does look like her with her cat. And um, yeah, but nothing really that memory, memorable except one evening. On one evening, she invited my mom and, um, and I to join some of her, with her, her small group of friends to have dinner. And well, I was, uh, I was a teenager and my brother was a little bit uh, younger, so he, um, you know, he, he wasn't ready. <laughs> my mom didn't take, take, talk him along because she wasn't, he wasn't ready for an adult gathering. So um, my mom took me along, hang out with them, and I, all I remember was they were talking about business. They were talking about economics, well, the economy, and um, basically everything, they, uh, the grown-up stuff. And let me tell you about a little bit about my mom. She's a tiny lady, tiny lady, grew up in Hong Kong. She, um, in the 50s, 60s, uh, if you know, back in those days, they have very limited um, uh, education. Um, she can speak um, basic, very basic English, um, but she's definitely very street smart. So I have no idea how did she manage to follow through the, all the conversations on those during that night. They were talking about all these other things and my mom was like just nodding and listened very with a lot of intent. But I think that's what makes her valuable on that, on that night because she turned up. She was there. She turned up and she, she was value adding in a, in, in a way because she brought me along. So, so I was the value added part. As the kid, the only kid at the dining table on that night, I was listening, I must have been listening with the same kind of intent, the same kind of focus like my mom did. And someone took notice. He was a um, older gentleman in his 70s and he was a semi-retired uh, entrepreneur who started a um, orange juice. Well, it's New Zealand, come on. So very fresh orange. So he started an orange juice um, uh, a factory, manufacturing uh, business. And he, he noticed and he came up to me and asked if I understand what he, all the story and everything that he talked about, uh, the, the, the juice making industry. So my response was yes and tell me more. Okay. Yes, and tell me more. And I remember, you know, I remember I actually barely understand, <laughs> understood anything that they talked about that night. But as a kid, I, be, I just soaked it all up that night. The vibe in the room, everything, the exchange between these adults, I just soaked it all up. And this gentleman, he, he, he then, I remember very, very vividly, even today, he turned around to my mom and he said, you know what, your son, Michael, he has sparkles in his eyes. Okay, you can come up to look later if I still have the sparkle. <laughs> Woody Allen said, if you want to be in a job where they don't accept you, Turn up. Make yourself useful. Let people get to know you. Eventually, they will accept you because you are part of their community. Well, you're part of their universe, in a sense. So, I believe, well, IBM believes as well, good design is good business. And great designers would make sure the design is value-adding. It's an addition to life, to business. And you do that by letting go of, the, of a very widespread cynicism that, happen, that, that, that exists in our today's world. You let that go. 
by being positive and by always asking what if, and most importantly, always when someone seeks your help, respond by saying yes and, yes and, what else can I bring onto the table? And I think that is very important for designers in today's world because you cannot be just sitting in front of your laptop, in, behind your Mac, and just doing craft work. You need to be adding value to business. And yes, and now we come to the end of my talk. We are human beings, we are not machine. So we have hopes and fears. And fear is always sort of lurking in the background, but it always exists. But we should embrace both hopes and fears because it helps you to understand we need to recognize these hopes and fears so that we know how can we design, as designers, we can, how can we design a better way forward. Especially as now we, we are hustling in a world that's filled with complexity, filled with ambiguity. And we need to recognize this hope. And I'm very happy to see a lot of you have taken a chance to uh, written on the post note and stick it up there. And the world is going to get even more complex and more ambigu ambig ambiguous because you know what? Facebook just tell you that the metaverse is coming. So how can we, how might we design for this kind of unknown, right? I did that too. I did this exercise too. My hope is that I hope I could inspire everyone to design a better world. My fear is my story doesn't resonate with you and it's not action actionable enough. That's my fear. So with this fear, let's, let me tackle that right now. <laughs> to overcome my fear, let me now introduce you, let me now give you the loop. The loop is came from the IBM Enterprise Design Thinking approach. It's something I'm very, uh, it taught me everything, uh, how to do design, observe the challenge, observe the user, reflect as a team, and make prototypes. But and it, it is an endless iterative approach. But I believe this more than, this approach can apply more than just in business or design, but you can apply in life as well. And that's what I've been always doing. As we talk about tackling ambiguity, tackling the complexity of business nowadays and life nowadays, you need to observe the challenge and understand the challenge that the ambiguity that you face, the ambiguity, the challenge that um, the ambiguity, ambiguity brings. And then you gotta take time as a designer, as a human being, to reflect, to think about, really think very, very deeply what to let go. What can you relearn? Where can you add value? A lot of the time, especially we're living in such a quick pace of a world, we just dive in. We just dive in front of the computer and just design. We just dive in and give, you know, deliver your deliverables. We don't spend enough time to think. And I think the, I believe the reflect stage is very, very important for a designer. And, but as much as how important it is to observe the challenge, observe the user, reflect as well, I do believe action is important too. So make sure you make, you make your everyday a prototype. Make your everyday as a prototype. So do not fear. To, um, to prototype your tomorrow because the design force will be with you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, we're going to open up to Q&A now. So we've got about 10 minutes. Does anyone want to kind of just start us off? Uh, oh, I need to ching. Could I have that other mic? Sorry. Hang on just a second. Working? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Yeah. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for, for the speech. It was super interesting. Uh, thank you for this. Well, I'll go to the question, straight to the question. What if the reflect part is too short? Like, what if we need answers now? What if we need the, yeah, the solution now? How, how do we deal with when that time is, is too limited? Mm. What would you suggest? Thank you. Great question. How, how short and how long do we spend it at each of the each of the phases, right? Well, the truth is, you can do. Okay, the truth is, you can. Um, it's it's actually up to you. How much? How how, how long can you? You know, um, uh, you can spend on each phase. But one thing we always encourage our designer to do is to loop as quickly as possible. It doesn't mean if you spend hours and hours to just sit around and think, it's going to make your design better. It doesn't mean you spend you know, two years to doing your user research will make your design better. Well, it will in, some, in a way, but it doesn't mean um, you, know, you will come up with the perfect answer. So, which is why it's important that we spend just enough time that we can look very, very quickly understand the, the situation, understand the context, the circumstances as much, as, much as, as, in, as quick as possible so that we can reflect on it, we can think through it in the limited time that you are given or you, that you can allow yourself to have and quickly make an assumption, make a prototype and test it. So the concept of the loop is that you can start off anywhere as well. You can start sometimes, especially in Hong Kong, your client looking for you to deliver something, create a prototype instantly create some sort of design, push it out to the market, push it out to the client, but always educate them that it is important that you observe again, you test your concept again. So um, I hope it answered your question. All right. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, Michael. Hello. I'm interested to know how you transition from a very visual-based medium in advertising to what you do now, which I think it's more of a high-level systematic thinking, like design thinking. How, how did that transition happen? Um, I, well, two, 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 two things. First, I, I was very lucky. I was very, very blessed by the fact that I, had, I always had a boss and senior who were, um, who were very strategic. So um, it's interesting when I, when, when, earlier when I talked about the story of uh, when I came back to Hong Kong, I, I wasn't quite ready about the, all the challenge from, a, from both a professional sense and also from a cultural sense. It's because I realized when I first came back to Hong Kong, a lot of agencies, a lot of creative, they were very visual driven, like you, said, like you would just say. And, and, and they, they would just focus on the craft and they don't have enough thinking. So, so throughout my career, once I have that realization that the direction that I should go, I don't know my, where's my destination, but I do know sort of a direction. And the direction is I need to go, um, a, go with a career that's a little bit more strategic, like a planner, like a, uh, like a strategist. And then I start looking for jobs with boss, with senior who think alike. And um, so I guess both uh, a bit of a planning, but al also a bit of um, uh, um, uh, uh, luck as well, that I, I was able to find them so that I could, um, I could continuously learning. And the second part of the equation is learning. Because when you were a young designer, um, as much as you try to kind of think in a high level or try to understand more, um, there's always uh, some sort of a ceiling. But if you know that you, that is the direction you want to go, you would just keep learning. Uh, when, when I first joined IBM five years ago, the first six months to 12 months, um, there was a lot of learning. From a creative, suddenly go into a consultancy. I, back in the creative world, uh, um, agency world, I can just let my account service people, my colleagues, to deal with the client. Now, suddenly, I need to be sitting in front of a client, handling the client, managing the expectation. I was basically 
doing everything from AS to 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 planning to to um, to creative. So so like I said, let it all go so that it push yourself to keep learning. Uh, and 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 nowadays the the demand on what a designer can do is just growing and growing and growing because design start getting to a mature stage where it is really placed at the center of everything everything a business do. So um, so I think it's important for us to, 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 to learn, keep learning. So if that's the direction you want to go, seek those opportunities. Seek the help from those people. You know, find a boss who can think strategically and learn from them. Yeah. You're welcome. Sorry. Hi, Michael. I'm Jess. Um, I, I have a question about the positioning of IBM iX team. So, because IBM as a tech consultancy, then I want to understand, do clients come to IBM iX um, as a standalone service? Or do clients, are clients coming in for IBM iX as a upsell opportunity from tech consultancy? And then you have... Um, interaction or a customer experience design consultancy as an add-on or value-added service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a question for you. Are you from Accenture? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but, but great that question. <laughs> I'm not, no, no. <laughs> just, no, just because I'm also from, um, I'm from, also from consultancy, mm -hmm. also work in trend forecasting, so I'm yep. interested to know, you know where the opportunities <laughs> would come from. So Sorry, just thinking strategically. I'll start looking up, so i start teasing people. Um, um, I can tell you this uh, very quickly. I can tell you the, the sort of the journey that IBM IX, um have gone through. Five years ago when I first joined, it was, uh, it was a new brand. It was a new entity within IBM. So we were, we were sort of like the, the add-on. So people would come to us. Um, well, IBM has a lot of long-term clients. So traditionally, people go to IBM when they look for a server, when they look for infrastructure. So back then, it was an add-on. Um, people, add, well, as you said, value-added service, they look for um, someone to design the web, someone to design the app, uh, so that's, that's how we got some new business back then. But as the market mature and also as the team mature, as we grew, um, now we, we are pretty much almost like a standalone brand, I mean, standalone brand, but we work very, very tightly with the rest of IBM. Um, earlier, I showed you the, um, the late um, uh, journey that, that whole journey of, um, well, I, I better not go back <laughs> to many slides, but um, that whole journey, that whole approach, um, where we, the, we took the client from co-creating to, to, to co-execution to co-operation, is a holistic approach that we, not just IBM IX can work on, but um, we, well, we, most of the time we might work on the, the, the beginning of the project um, to help them to, um, define the problem, to help them to discover all the pain points and all that. But because of the maturity that we have now, we work as one, what we call the garage um, approach. So we bring all the, um, all the technologies, all the um, strategists and business consultants and all together to transform a, uh, a project. So, so I think that in a sense, in, in itself, it actually reflects how design um, and the industry has changed. Because, like I mentioned before, um, um, designers, the demand on designers is getting more and more. Uh, it also means um, the, our role has to be much wider than just adding value from a design perspective. But, I mean, a traditional visual design perspective, but in a, in a holistic, sort of a, a more comprehensive approach to, to, to business design, in a sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it was a couple of observations. One which is, um, I think historically when we think of our parents, we think of careers and long-term planning. And if you're going to work in a civil service, you're going to spend the next 50 years working in it. If you're going to work in a multinational firm, you're going to be there for the next 50 years and get your, your golden pension, etc. cetera. Um, how the rise of SMEs, there's just more and more and more small businesses, medium-sized businesses. There's just a huge population. There's so much more opportunity. Um, I think one of the things is it's all about um, 
our careers is all about timing and luck. Um, it's not about having to study something and be perfect. I, I left school when I was 17, um, qualified as an accountant when I was 27. Um, and I'm now from, from, from London here in Hong Kong. But I think the two points I want to make, one which is always take risks in your career. Always try and do something different. You don't have to do the same thing for the rest of your life. That's number one. I think uh, number two is, again, going from small business to big business or however you want to mix it. Find the things that you enjoy. Find something that you're passionate about. And actually, eventually, you will be able to monetize that. I, I think that's very key. It's not about... I think also one of the things, certainly here in Hong Kong, we see is a lot of young people want to, to, to be promoted quick, earn a higher salary quick, and get successful by the time they're 28. And I think one of the things there is our careers are very long-term. Actually, <clears throat> the older we become, the better we are, the more we are worth. And I think the final point was share. Always share. Um, share your knowledge, because we're always going to be able to empower others, to help others improve. But also, actually, when we share, other people will be able to come back to us and actually share their ideas. And it also allows us, in, as we get older, to also have that perpetual improvement. I am so glad the way that you, you re, re, almost like recap, recapture everything and better than I did. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I couldn't agree more. Um, the fact is, yeah, as I look back to my career, um, even though I, when I said, you know, I hopped from one major to another, I was testing, I was making a prototype. And, and, and again, credit back to my mom and my dad as well. More my mom. Well, <laughs> my mom and my dad um, as well, because um, people will ask. People in the, in, in the family will ask, what is Michael doing? Why is he spending so much time? in the university, and I, I'm definitely not a quick starter in terms of my career. Um, I start late, and in, in when I joined um, the agency world, I was, God knows, 27 or 8? It's pretty, in, kind of old for, for, for a creator. Um, but, but I guess a lot happened in the last five, six years, and, and I think, like you said, that I was taking risk. I was testing you know, what I love, how, whatever I love, how does it make how it, how it is valuable to the business that I'm working with. How, how And I always question, I guess sub, even subconsciously, I was questioning myself whether I'm adding value to the agency. If I'm not adding value to the agency or, or the company, um, I, I would question, you know, is it my problem? Is this the alignment problem? I was reflecting all along within internally so that I could make a prototype a career prototype. I could pivot, I could t take risk, and timing as well. Five years ago, I, I thank God, um, when I moved on from advertising to UX design, that was the best timing I ever done my career. That was before um, the, the, the market sort of get mature. I could still leverage my experience in, in advertising, so I really have no complaint um, to to whatever power upstairs. But, um, but yeah, you, that, you're so true the way that you uh, capture that. Thank you. Yeah. OK, I think we have a last question back here. I don't know if it's really a question, but I'm in keeping with the theme, I'm going to go yes and. So everything you said plus. Well done. There's, uh, there's a concept called planned happenstance that I sort of stumbled across. Mm -hmm. And there's academic research on it. And it's kind of like, so look, the old fashioned way of finding a career is do a survey. Are oh, you like numbers? Be an accountant. Are oh, you like biology? Be a doctor. And that's it. You know, it's a one shot deal. This thing is no, no, you should experiment with everything. You know, like show up at things like this. This has got nothing to do with my day job, but that's why I love coming along to these things. And every month I should have mentioned that at the start. It's, it, I do mention it in the book. I don't have anything to do with any of the design, architects, whatever people that are doing here. But that's why I get so much value out of it. So you guys probably should show up at unrelated industry events as well. The probability of learning something there and creating value is so much higher than just hanging around people that do what you do. So planned happenstance is amazing. It's completely aligned to this productive accident. The good thing that you did is you didn't chuck a tantrum when your mum said, we're going to that dinner, right? A lot of, a lot of kids, my kids maybe, uh, could have done that. My oldest daughter just finished her degree in Melbourne, kind of like you, she bounced around. And in real time, you're not sure where it's going to end up, but she started in design, then flipped to anthropology, then psychology, then media. 
I don't know what you call that degree, but she come, she's come out and she now knows herself so well. Mm. She got two offers in one week and she's working for this firm and she's just she's loving her career from day one, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I started in accounting and I've tried to get away from that kind of stuff, even though I'm still working in a bank in finance and stuff. You know, so there's lots of ways to make it all make sense. And I'm assuming we're all going to live to 120, so we've probably got to get another three or four careers, you know, in our future, mm -hmm. potentially. So... Keep up the good work. I have actually done that ADP list thing as well. I know Stephen Gates. Uh, I met him, yep. you know, at my firm. He used to work at where, I, well where I work. So, yeah, great guy. So, it's great you already, yes, and, and yeah. also you're giving your, 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 your skills, your experience, knowledge away on, on ADP list. So, great stuff. Well done. And I think, um, you know, you, you touch on it. Um, uh, so a very key point, especially for young designers, is that... Um, Whatever you learned before, the journey you have been through before, the, the job that works or not didn't work before, it all contributes to, to the ultimate you know, sort of destination or whatever you're going to land, land in. And, and, I, and I, start in, I started in computer science. I started in accounting, studied information system, e-commerce, and marketing. And then all those things come back to what I do nowadays. Um, I need to look at numbers. I need to understand business. If I want to be a strategic designer, I need to understand numbers. And that's what I've been learning. I've been, like, like you said, I, I, I don't, nowadays I don't spend a lot of time um, reading design stuff. Um, I spend most of my time reading business stuff, um, talking to people from business background, from different background, different industry. And, and, uh, and I think if you, if you think back to... Um, if you look at some of the best designers, legendary designers, they always said, your design is an extension of you, is an extension of your life. And you need to have a very rich life, rich experience across industry, across whatever your interest is, so that you can then be creative. And I think that's, that's the secret to, um, to a good designer, is that you, you need to be able to walk all walks of life and then combine it, let it digest in, you know, within so that you can come up with something even better. Yeah. So good luck with your book. I'm, I would love to re read it as well. Yeah. Okay, big round of applause for Michael, guys. Thank you.